Jesus, one of the most influential figures in human history, made an enduring impact as a preacher and religious leader. Yet before ascending to his pivotal role in Christianity, his life during the lost years, roughly spanning from the age of 12 to 30, remained largely concealed. He led a life hidden from the curious eyes of Bible followers. So in this video, we dive into the hidden chapters of Jesus' life, shedding light on the lesser known aspects of his journey from the age of 12. Here's what the church doesn't want you to know about the lost years of Jesus. The Gospels recount the birth of Jesus and his journey to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod the Great. There is a reference in the Bible that Mary and Jesus lived in Nazareth. Another isolated account tells of Joseph of Nazareth, Mary, and Jesus' visit to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover when he was only 12. In fact, Jesus was a refugee in Egypt and stayed in a cave with Mary and Joseph. It is also believed that Joseph, the carpenter, worked at the Babylon fortress nearby. When Jesus was still an infant, King Herod of Judea ordered him to kill all firstborns. The Holy Family fleed to Egypt and they stayed in a cave. But the next 18 years of his life are filled with mystery, except for the reference that Jesus was a wise man favored by God. The Bible says no more about his life during this period. Some Christians believe that Jesus lived in Nazareth during those years until the events recounted in the Bible occurred. However, some evidence proves that the Son of God made many trips around the world. Let's dive in. First, we have to consider the name Jesus was a common name in the time when Jesus Christ lived. In that era, many people in the region used this name. It was a simple and ordinary name, not associated with any particular significance. Today, a name that's similarly common and ordinary might be John. Just like Jesus in the past, common sense dictates that Jesus was formed in the culture of his people. In those years, it was customary for children of the time to go to the synagogue school in Nazareth where he may have spent his first years of life. Jesus' school education was divided into two levels. First, he studied in the so-called House of the Book, the equivalent of elementary school, where he learned to read the sacred books written in Hebrew. Likewise, he memorized the Torah, which contains the Jewish people's law and identity heritage. The education of the citizens of Nazareth also had a secondary level known as the House of Interpretation, which was completely optional. There, the students learned the basic elements necessary to fulfill the Jewish laws and interpret them. There is a remote possibility that Jesus studied in this educational establishment and deepened his study of the scriptures in the Temple of Jerusalem with a teacher or rabbi. On the other hand, some researchers affirm that he mastered multiple languages, such as Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. This could have been of great use to him on his long journey. In fact, many authors claim to have found evidence of the existence of Jesus' writings in India and Tibet, and thanks to their work, we may be one step closer to finding the truth. Religious leader Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, Swami Abhedananda, and Nikolai Rorich wrote about the lost years of Jesus. The first document that seems to explain the mysterious years of Jesus is titled The Aquarian Gospel, written in 1908 by Levi H. Dowling. The Aquarian Gospel has been published and translated into several languages and claims to be the true story of Jesus' life and includes the missing 18 years hushed up in the New Testament. In the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ, Levi H. Dowling proposes a narrative where Jesus, during the unaccounted lost years, embarks on a spiritual journey through various eastern regions like India, Tibet, Persia, Assyria, Greece, and Egypt. Dowling depicts Jesus as a spiritual seeker who eagerly learns from diverse cultures and traditions engaging with wise teachers and philosophers. Controversially, Dowling suggests that Jesus, like all humans, experienced reincarnation, implying that he had past lives and was on a path of self-discovery and enlightenment. Eventually, the book narrates Jesus' return to Judea, where he initiates his public ministry, sharing the spiritual wisdom he had acquired during his travels. Dowling's narrative offers an alternative perspective on Jesus' life and teachings, but it differs significantly from traditional Christian beliefs. Dowling claims to have practiced meditation for 40 years in order to read the Akashic records that gave him access to this lost knowledge. His version has more esoteric elements than the last three years of preaching in Judea recounted in the Bible. The book consists of 22 chapters covering the entire life of Jesus from his birth to his death and was written between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. each day for some mysterious reason known only to the author. One set of theories also claims that Buddhism substantially influenced the life and teachings of Jesus. According to Elmer R. Gruber and Holger Kirsten, who were both psychologists and independent scholars, stated that he lived in Egypt and was a disciple of the Buddhist monastic order of the Therapeuti. It is believed that Jesus was influenced by the teachings and practices of the Therapeuti, 
described by these authors as the teachers of the Theravada Buddhist school established in Judea. These Buddhist teachings can be seen reflected in the Sermon on the Mount, the parables, the choice of disciples, and the denunciation of false prophets. However, Gruber and Kirsten were not the only ones who could see the correlation between Christianity and Buddhism. A group of scholars believe that Jesus may have been inspired by the Buddhist religion because of texts found in the Nag Hammadi manuscript found in Egypt, and what we know about them could be the key to unraveling one of history's greatest mysteries. The Nag Hammadi library is a collection of texts, mostly ascribed to early Gnostic Christianity, discovered about 100 kilometers from Luxor in Upper Egypt. They are papyrus codices bound in leather, except for the remains of a third one carefully kept in a ceramic jar, sealed and hidden in a nearby cave. But why would anyone go to the trouble of hiding such knowledge? That's what historians wondered a few decades ago. In December 1945, Muhammad, his brothers Caliph Ali and Abu al-Majd of the al-Saman clan, as well as four other peasants, approached the Jabal al-Tarif mountain massif, about 11 kilometers northeast of Nag Hammadi. What began as a search for fertilizer for their crops led them to stumble upon sacred knowledge. They dug under a large stone mass and stumbled upon a ceramic jar filled with lost knowledge. The peasants, of course, did not know this, so they simply broke it open and found pieces of carefully bound codex. Muhammad Ali suspected the value of this knowledge and gave a codex to the Coptic priest of his village, who in turn showed it to the local history teacher. In October 1946, these texts would end up in the hands of the Coptic Museum in Cairo. For example, the Gospel of Thomas, found among the Nag Hammadi texts, contains a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus, offering a unique perspective on his teachings. The Nag Hammadi texts, including the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Dialogue of the Savior, and the Thunder, Perfect Mind, offer diverse and often metaphorical perspectives on early Christian and Gnostic spirituality. The Gospel of Philip explores spiritual union, the significance of baptism, and the roles of men and women in the spiritual journey using allegorical language. The Gospel of Mary, attributed to Mary Magdalene, underscores inner spiritual understanding and enlightenment through teachings and conversations after Jesus' death. The Apocalypse of Peter vividly describes visions of heaven and hell, shedding light on early Christian ideas about the afterlife and moral consequences. The Dialogue of the Savior delves into spiritual teachings, self-knowledge, and the pursuit of wisdom in a conversation between Jesus and disciples. Lastly, the thunder perfect mind, voiced by a divine feminine figure, challenges conventional notions of divinity, embodying wisdom and mystery through poetic paradoxes and dualities. A young French scholar, Jean Dorès, soon realized the value of this manuscript. At the same time, other codices were found in various places, almost as if someone wanted them to be discovered. Within two of the 13 codices discovered in December 1945, at the foot of the Jabal al-Tarif Massif, was found the Gospel of Truth. Also known as the Gospel of Valentinus, it is one of the Gnosis-related treatises of early Christianity discovered in Upper Egypt. The Gospel of Truth constitutes Treatise 3 Codex Jung of the Nag Hammadi manuscripts. Although unusable and written in Sahidic Coptic, some fragments make up the second book of Codex de Tuelten of the Nag Hammadi Library. Despite this, they are considered a work of power and beauty, and in essence, one of the keys to understanding the lost years of Jesus. No wonder then that Jung, one of the foremost explorers of the psyche of our time, was so attracted to Gnostic doctrines and concluded that many of the Gnostics were nothing more than psychologists. Psychologists in the deep and etymological sense of the word psychology. In other words, sages of the soul and spirit. However, the Gospel of Truth could be much more than a liturgical homily. It can also be considered a sermon of initiation to Christian Gnosis. Therefore, it would not be unreasonable to assert that the Valentian school was never intended or separated from the official church, but was set apart due to the incomprehension of the uninitiated in the occult wisdom referred to by the Apostle Paul. These Christian Gnostics and the members of their most important school, the Valentinians, were members of the Christian communities responsible for treasuring this knowledge. And thanks to the work of a few curious people, we have rediscovered his work. But these people were not the only ones who contributed to unraveling this mystery. In 1887, the Russian war correspondent Nicholas Notovich visited India and Tibet. During his trip, he claimed that in the Lamasari or Buddhist monastery of Hemis Ladakh, he heard about a manuscript on the life of Saint Isa, the best of the sons of men. His book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, tells of a divine child named Isa, born in the first century to a poor family in Israel. Isa is the Arabic name for Jesus in Islam. According to this book, Jesus came to India at 14 and learned the laws of Buddhism before returning to Israel at 29. 
The book also tells how he visited many pilgrimage sites in India during those years, such as Varanasi, Puri, and Rajagriha, before finally traveling eastward to Tibet. There, Buddhist monks prepared and trained him with knowledge dating back 500 years before his birth, and taught him the art of healing. It is important to remember that Buddhism is more a way of life than a religion. That is why it can easily be associated with Christianity. Critics questioned the authenticity of Notovich's findings, with some alleging that the monks at the Himis Monastery, where he claimed to have found the manuscript, denied any knowledge of him or the text. However, two disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Abhedananda and Swami Trigunatitananda, separately visited the Himis Monastery and were reassured by the monks that Notovich had indeed spent time there. They were shown the manuscript, and Swami Abhedananda confirmed that it contained the same content as described in Notovich's book. Subsequently, Abhedananda had the English translation of Notovich's text printed in India. Despite previous prohibitions by Christian authorities, Swami Trigunatitananda also reported seeing two paintings at the monastery, one depicting Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, and the other showing Jesus meditating in the Himalayan forest, surrounded by tamed wild beasts. Later, Dr. Nicholas Rorich, a well-known scholar and explorer, visited Ladakh and was similarly shown the manuscript by the monks. He too wrote about his observations in his book, The Heart of Asia, supporting the claim that Jesus had spent time in Buddhist monasteries during his lost years. It is also mentioned that the British government in India attempted to acquire and destroy such manuscripts after the English edition of Notovich's book was published. As proof of this, many of Jesus' teachings have similarities to the teachings and miracles of Buddha as they preach and promote love, compassion, and self-discipline. Jesus accepted the teachings of Buddhism and returned to his homeland, ready to preach this knowledge. Unfortunately, a couple of years after he returned from his journey, he was crucified on the orders of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, giving rise to the events recounted in the Bible. But even the biblical account can help us understand these past events. But to do so, we must approach the following theory with an open mind. Researchers point out that Jesus may have been drugged or sedated on the cross to be protected from the intense pain and give the impression of death. His body was taken down within hours, even though it is scientifically proven that it takes days to die on a cross because none of the internal organs are damaged in the process. Every year during Holy Week in the Philippines, some Christians volunteer to experience the pain of crucifixion under the belief of purging their sins, and they do not die from it. The prolonged stay on the cross causes more deaths due to asphyxiation than bodily wounds. This is because the hands are stretched out on both sides of the cross, which flattens the chest and over time can restrict airflow to the lungs, causing death due to lack of oxygen. Despite this, the Gospels say that Jesus died within three to six hours of being crucified. However, the crucifixion began in the third hour and he was quickly taken down from the cross and sent to be embalmed in a tomb. That is why it is hard to believe that he died in such a short time. Perhaps due to the drug or shock of the crucifixion, Jesus went into an induced coma or had a near-death experience. Considering that medical science was not as advanced as today, it makes sense that he was mistakenly presumed dead, and that mistake could have saved his life. Many people have returned to life after near-death experiences or being certified clinically dead. Some of them claim to have been on the other side, found a light at the end of the road, or seen or heard conversations they had no way of knowing while they remained in a deep sleep. And eventually, some of these souls returned to narrate what they had seen. If Jesus had been one of them, this fact, inexplicable to the science of old, could have been considered a resurrection. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus prepared to embalm the supposedly deceased body of Jesus, they brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe weighing about 100 pounds. Interestingly, these herbs are healing. The Gospels speak that the disciples saw Jesus as if he were alive. He ate and drank, and Thomas was even able to touch his wounds. It is possible that Christianity sought to hide Jesus' humanity in order to give more weight to his teachings, or that the real story was altered by oral accounts. But no matter what happened, it is logical to assume that he could not continue living in Palestine after being crucified, so he had to find a way to flee before facing the same fate again. And what better place to escape than India? Jesus is said to have fled to Kashmir, where he lived and died until his 80th year. Yeah, I know I said it, his 80th year. In downtown Srinagar, there is a tomb that gained significant attention in 1899, when Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement, claimed it to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. He wrote about this in his book, Masi Hindustan Mine, Jesus in India, published in Urdu in 1908 and later in English in 1944. According to Ahmad, Jesus survived the crucifixion, traveled to the Indian subcontinent, lived until the age of 120, 
and was buried in Kashmir. This is in contrast to the Bible and Quran, which state that Jesus was crucified and ascended to heaven. The claim was partly based on a rock carving in the shrine, possibly of Yuz Asaf, showing feet with wounds resembling crucifixion injuries. Ahmad identified Yuz Asaf as Jesus, and the term means son of Joseph. Some researchers suggest that the tomb is oriented east-west, following Jewish tradition, rather than the Muslim north-south direction. To align it with Muslim tradition, a gravestone was placed in a north-south direction. Some experts believe Jesus came to Kashmir during the reign of Raja Gopadatta, 49-109 AD, because Kashmiris are considered descendants of one of the ten missing tribes of Israel who settled in new countries along the Silk Route after being driven out of Israel in 700 BC. Some Kashmiri tribes even call themselves Bnei Israel, or Children of Israel. Originally, the burial place may have been a cave or stone room with a simple shelter to house a false casket containing artifacts associated with Yuz Asaf, believed by some to be a Hebrew name rather than Arabic or Muslim. The site was recorded as early as 112 AD and attracted pilgrims long before the advent of Islam in the region. Today, the shrine is located near a Muslim cemetery and the famous Dastgir Sahib Shrine. It is a single-story rectangular stone building with a traditional Kashmiri sloping roof and three arches on the front. The idea that Jesus would escape to India makes sense if we accept that he visited these lands during his lost years. It is reasonable that he would have to decide to take refuge in a place where he would be well received. But what if instead of traveling to India, he decided to escape to the United States? According to the Mormon theory, Jesus visited the American continent in the year 34 AD after being crucified to preach to his other flock composed of Jews from Israel who would later become the ancestors of the American Indians. The Book of Mormon tells of one of the lost tribes of Israel descended from Joseph who crossed the Pacific Ocean and came to America. An ancient Israelite prophet descended from that tribe named Lehi had two sons on the continent, Nephi and Laman. After Lehi's death, his descendants were divided into two groups the Nephites and the Lamanites. For centuries, both groups lived in continuous dispute until God chose the Nephites as his people because of their kind and righteous character and their belief in the prophecy that announced the arrival of Christ to the American continent. So they waited. The Nephites preserved their history and religious beliefs in writing, while the Lamanites repudiated the existence of Christ. One day, a certain Nephite prophet named Mormon decided to collect the sacred writings of his people and leave them in the hands of his son Moroni, who was in charge of burying them in a place where God would preserve them until another prophet was called to translate them. Centuries passed until, in 1823 in New York, a 17-year-old young man named Joseph Smith claimed to have met Moroni's angel, who revealed where to find the tablets with the complete everlasting gospel, just as Christ gave it to the ancient inhabitants of America. Smith translated the tablets and turned them into what is known today as the Book of Mormon, the text that tells the story of Jesus' arrival in the Americas. The book tells of a pre-Columbian civilization that was the precursor of the American Indians and inhabited by whites, blacks, and Indians who knew the wheel, cement, iron, wheat, barley, elephants, and horses. Together, they founded a great civilization with majestic buildings and remarkable cultural and scientific advances in a period of peace and harmony. But the peace did not last long. The cultural boom of this civilization intensified 200 years after the arrival of Jesus Christ until a period of slavery and decadence shattered their efforts. According to Cesar Castillo Valdez, a graduate of the National School of Anthropology, the hierarchs of the Mormon Church began to relate the stories and drawings of the English about the Mayan and Olmec civilizations with the towns, cities, and stories of the Book of Mormon. This gave rise to an ambitious archaeological project in Chiapas, Central America, and part of the Yucatan Peninsula to try to corroborate the relationship between the civilizations of Mesoamerica and the Mormon theory. As you can see, many of these theories seem to contradict each other. Some believe that Jesus was a Buddhist monk who traveled to India and Tibet during the Lost Years, while others claim that he crossed the ocean to preach his faith in America after he was resurrected. So who should we trust? If we rely solely on biblical texts, we can assume that Jesus lived in Egypt until the death of Herod the Great. But even that theory can be challenged. At the end of the 8th century BC, the prophet Micah announced the birth of the future king of the Jews in Bethlehem. Eight centuries later, Jesus was born in that city after Herod the Great became king of Judea. The reign of Herod the Great was characterized by the systematic elimination of his enemies. According to a local legend, he felt betrayed by the Magi from the East, who were to tell him the exact place of Christ's birth, and ordered the execution of all children under two years of age born in Bethlehem. The story also tells how Joseph, the father of Jesus, 
learned of Herod's plans after an angel warned him in his dreams. So he decided to take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Soon after, a tragic event known as the Slaughter of the Innocents was unleashed. The only problem is that most historians doubt the veracity of this story. After all, the Judeo-Roman historian Flavius Josephus does not mention the episode in any of the works he documented extensively on first-century Jewish history, where he exposed many of the monarch's misdeeds. Therefore, there is little reason to believe he would have concealed such an important event. For his part, the specialist in primitive Christianity, Antonio Pinheiro, affirms that Herod's attempt to kill Jesus, as well as the slaughter of the children, correspond to the story of the exodus of the Pharaoh who wanted to kill Moses as a child, as well as the children of Israel. The exodus describes how Pharaoh ordered the slaughter of the Hebrew children after his scribes warned him of the imminent birth of a threat to his crown. And just like the Bible, Moses' father and mother were warned in a dream that the child's life was in danger and acted to save him. Therefore, the story could have been a fabrication of the writer of the gospel to assimilate the image of Jesus Christ as one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Be that as it may, the legend was passed down from generation to generation and eventually became a metaphor for good and evil. Despite this, no one can deny that Jesus has done a lot for the consciousness of humanity, whether these theories are true or not. His light has guided millions of people and will continue to do so for many years to come. So my friends, as we wrap up our exploration of the lost years of Jesus, I'd like to invite you to embark on your own journey of discovery. Our world is brimming with mysteries waiting to be unraveled and I encourage each of you to engage in your own research to expand your knowledge. I also want to express my gratitude for joining me on this journey. Everything in this video is based on theories, deep research, and ancient texts. I hope you appreciate this video, and may it spark a light of curiosity in you. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and liking this video. Your support motivates me to create more content like this. So now that you know what the church doesn't want you to know, prepare to dive even deeper into another ancient secret, the dark secrets of the Vatican. Discover the truths they've kept hidden for centuries in my latest video. And until next time, remember to always seek the truth.